So this is about pseudo random number generation and stream ciphers. So we talked about actually stream ciphers already. The last three modes of the mode, last three modes that we talked about like output feedback mode and counter feedback mode, they were stream ciphers because you take the bit and exclude your with the plain text and exclude your with some random thing and comes out the cipher text. But there are some other ciphers which are designed like that and there are other methods of generating the random bit stream that we already talked about. So we'll talk about those methods today, I mean in this lecture. So there are four parts or five parts in this chapter, seven. First is how do you generate random numbers? What are the principles and how do you generate them? And then how do you use block ciphers to generate them? And then what are the stream ciphers? And then RC4. RC4 is one of the commonly used stream ciphers. First of all, we call them pseudo-random, not random. Pseudo means half, you know, or not real, unreal or something like that, right? So pseudo-random means they are, they look like random, but they are not really random. Why do we need them? Well, actually, we really need random numbers, not pseudo-random numbers. So let me just say, we need random numbers because we want to use them as nonce, because we want to use them as key stream for one, one time pad. So this is the number stream that we use to exclusive or to the plain text is called one time pad. Right? That stream has to be totally random. So we need that, and this should satisfy two properties. One is this would be statistically random. That means if we ran any of the statistical tests, and there are many tests, chi-square, and in part of simulation, we need random numbers. So we have gone through testing and all that. So we, we need to have that uniform distribution. It should be equally, basically, all numbers should be equally likely, uniform distribution, independent, so that given one number, you should not be able to predict the second one. But for security we need even stronger thing not just independence we need unpredictability of the future values from previous values so if somebody has the previous values they should not be able to guess or get the future values so the true random numbers provide this but the pseudos don't pseudos are deterministic reproducible generated by a formula so pseudo random numbers are generated by a formula as i will show you and using that formula you can generate numbers that look random but anybody can generate them at any time so they are very predictable and for simulations we like those numbers because we want to be able to do the simulation and run it again and again and again and get the same result because if every time you run the simulation the result came out you wouldn't know when you want to demonstrate your simulation something totally different comes out so for, for simulation cases, we need that pseudo-ness in the random number. But for cryptography, we can't deal, we cannot, we don't want reproducibility like that. So first let me show you the pseudo-random number generators. A very simple example is that if you use this formula, xn is equal to 5xn minus 1 plus 1 mod 16. You start with x not equal to 5, put 5 here, 5 plus 5 is 25, 5 times 5 is 25, plus 1 is 26, mod 16 is 10. Right? Then you take 10, and you put 10 times 5, 50, plus 1, 51, and mod 16 is 3. So you keep doing this, and you will get this stream, 10, 3, 0, 1, 6, 15, 12, and blah, 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 and then again, 10, 3, 0, 1, 6, 15, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So you see they are cycling, right? Now first, before we talk about the cycle, let's talk about one more thing is that these numbers are between 0 and 6, 15. So we divide it by 16 to get these numbers, which are between 0 and 1. And generally, we like to have numbers between 0 and 1 because then we can get any size number by simple multiplication. But this is the number. So if you do any statistical test, this will pass the statistical test for all of those things we talked about before. So it is uniformly distributed. 
it is independence test actually there is no test for independence but you cannot see dependence there is no correlation and um, and what else we said we said statistically random yeah so th that's all there in this particular sequence but it is very predictable if somebody told me 0625 I could tell what the next number would be so this is not very good for cryptography but before we go for what is good for cryptography let's just see a little bit more theory of this so what you need is a seed the first number that you start is the seed and um, and then you have a cycle this is called the cycle length and um, the total thing this is called the tail and the total thing is called the period so you want really long period and you want a long cycle as well probably you want tail to be zero if possible at all so anyway so these are the good properties is long cycle and pay the period and 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 so you could select any seed suppose you started from here then you would go next 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 come back here and so this would be your cycle and period right so you have to really start the seed and depending on where you give the seed, you, your cycle starts and then you, you come back to the similar things. So it was done in 1951 by D.H. Lehmer. He actually, I think he worked for IBM, but I'm not sure. Um, and he simply observed a very, very simple thing that the powers of a number have good random power. The, the powers of a number, when, mo when used in the mod arithmetic, have a very good randomness properties. So if you take A and raise it to power N, and you do mod M, then th this thing comes out very good random. Okay? So this same thing can be written up as Xn is equal to A times Xn minus 1 mod M, where A is the multiplier, M is the modulus, and Xn is the next number. Xn minus 1 is the previous number. So this is how we started. Then at that time he selected A equal to 23 and M is equal to 10 raised to 8 plus 1 and both these numbers were good because um, he was working on a decimal machine. So multiplication by 10 raised to 8 is, is trivial or division by 10 raised to 8 is trivial in a decimal machine. But we don't have any more decimal machines. We have binary machines. So uh, when we select nowadays we don't use M like that. Second thing is, um, he selected A equal to 23, so people have generalized it since then. Um, now we use A times Xn plus B, so we also have an additive component mod M, and then there are whole books, Knuth has written whole volumes about how to select A, B, and M. So this is called linear congruential generator linear because this function is a linear function a n a times x n minus 1 plus b is a linear function congruential because modulo function generator so that is the linear modulo modulus based generators lcgs and it is mixed because it is not just multiplicative it is additive also so you could have multiplicative lcgs or you could have mixed lcg this is mixed lcg the, op the order of operation is that you, okay, so here's the thing, the question is whether the, the, modulo, the, the R mod function is last, the answer is it doesn't, it shouldn't really matter, because the, this, this is, by the way, M is not very small number, M is a large number, and all of these numbers are less than M, except that when you multiply, this can become more than M. Okay, x n minus 1 is less than m clearly, right? But when you multiply it with a, say let's say a is simple 2, and x n minus 1 is 2 raised to 31, or something like that. Yeah, so, 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 the, so the thing is, you could do mod, the thing is, what I was kind of getting to was that the mod is somehow distributed over, over plus sign, so you could do these and add them, it's the same thing. b mod m would be b for sure. But a times x n minus one, you could do the mod beforehand and then add b. Right? Okay. So, all right. So, so these numbers have problem that they are very predictable. So people said, no, no, we cannot use them. But they use something very similar in cryptography. 
in cryptography, what we use is a generator called Blum Blum Shub. These are the three people who gen who, whose last names are here. So, so this generator is as follows. You take xi minus 1, square it and do mod n, you get xi. And then you don't take the whole xi, you just take the last bit of xi. Just one bit. So the whole operation generates one bit. How do you select n? To select n, you take two large primes, two very large primes. You, you don't use small primes. You took very, very large primes, p and q. And generally, you take primes, I mean, not generally, you, this is required, that you take primes that are 3 mod 4. I mean, okay, p mod 4 would be 3, and q mod 4 would be 3. Basically, what that means is that the last two bits of these primes have to be 1, 1. Okay, 3 mod, so basically, for example, let's see, here I have not written, but can you give me a prime number, a small prime number, not large prime number, that is 3 mod 4? 11. Yeah, 11 is a good number because 11 is 3 mod 4. 11 mod 4 is 3. What about 7? Is also right. And uh, and 3 itself. So the idea in all of these numbers, the last two bits are 1, 1. So that 3 mod 4 is simply guarantees that you don't start with 0, uh, zero 1 or 1, 0. Uh, actually, 1, 0 will never be a prime. But 0, 1 would be a, another possibility. So those primes are excluded. So you take two primes which have the last two bits 1, you multiply them, that becomes your n. And then you do this mod operation. Since this is a large prime and this is a large number, then you know it, this is all very difficult to break. And, um, and all you are using is one bit. So that's another thing is that nobody knows the whole xi. All they know is one bit. So even if you got 100 bits from the past, you don't know xi. And you cannot predict xi plus 1, and you cannot predict the next bit. And, and the reason is, another thing is that even though you know n, you don't know p and q. And you cannot find p and q because these are very large primes. Factorization is still very difficult. So today we will talk about why that is, you know, basically how do you do all this, what are the difficult ones later on. But one of the, <coughs> one of the theory and one of the difficulties that the current cryptography relies on, relies on is difficulty of factoring. It is very difficult to do factoring, it is very difficult to do log, and so on and so forth. <coughs> and so, you, it's very difficult to factor large primes. So therefore, it is unpredictable, given any run of bits, but it is very slow also. For, with all this operation, which takes you know, a lot of computer time, you get one bit. And therefore, you're not going to use this generator to generate the key string, uh, to generate that one-time pad. What you use it for to generate the keys. Once you get the keys, then use something faster to generate the pad. Pad is the key, uh, is the bit stream that the exclusive are to the plain text to get the ciphertext. So, for that, if you want to send hundred, if you want to send one gigabit per second, you really need one gigabit random bits per second, and so this is too slow for that. But you can easily get 128 random bits from here to generate a random key. So basically, there are three ways of generating random numbers. One is to take some source of true randomness. So. There are some things that, I mean, I, I kind of laugh in the word true randomness because the true randomness is simply true because we don't know the real mathematics behind it. Once, you know, we know the theory behind it or we know how it is done, how it is happening, then it is not random anymore. 
but today we don't know the theory, so therefore it's truly random. Okay? And um, so you take any source up to, to randomness, such as weather, you know, weather, temperature, things like that. I mean, we don't know the real theory, we don't know what the temperature tomorrow would be, we can just guess with a good probability. And so those are truly random, but someday they will be not so random. So you take a source of true randomness, and then you can use that as a bit stream. And there are some examples in the next slide. So truly random would be um, radiation counters, radio noise, audio noise, thermal noise, leaky capacitors, and all of these things. And they, nowadays they make, make those up in the CPUs. So they make leaky capacitors in the CPUs, so you can get a truly random number. So that would be one. I mean, uh, even those could have biases, and you know, and they, so they would not be truly random, because the temperature tomorrow cannot be totally random. It has to be somewhere close to 75, because today's temperature is 75. So you know, so it's the so truly random things also have bias. Okay. The second one is use the pseudo random stream, and uh, and the third one is that you use not only a seed but use something else along with the seed. So make it a little bit more random. So that is called pseudo-random function. This is a pseudo-random number generator, PRNG, and this is the true random number generator, TRNG. One of the easiest method to generate cryptographic random numbers, pseudo-random numbers, cryptographic pseudo-random numbers, is to really use one of these ciphers. You take anything and you encrypt it, that gives you pseudo-random number bits. Right? And that you can do fast because these encryption techniques are designed to be fast. So that is the way, basically. So you can use CTR, counter mode, and here is your initial value. You keep increasing it by one and keep encrypting it with a key, and that gives you pseudo-random bits that you can use for one time pad. Or you can use the output feedback mode. Remember we talked about that already, that you just take something and then you encrypt it and whatever comes out becomes the next seed value. So this is um, basically, uh, which is, um, which can be used to create um, keys. And that, so basically, um, this could be used to create even master keys, which means the master key, random master key. Um, the problem would still be there as to how we send it over to the other side, but um, the gen whoever is generating the key could use these things to generate the master key, and then it says that for creating session keys from master keys, is that um, when we are talking, when two computers are talking, they keep changing the keys every few minutes. By, de by deriving the keys from the previous keys and things like that. So the keys are not used for very long. Same keys are not used for very long. So those are called session keys. From master key, you derive the session keys. Just like we derive the round keys from master key, from the main key. Similarly, in a communication session, uh, in a communication, we keep deriving the session keys from the master key. So here is a sophisticated generator for cryptography purposes, is specified in X9.17 standard. And see, everybody knows what is NC. Everybody knows who knows? American National Standards Institute, NC. And um, so there are many standards bodies in the United States, um, but this is national in the sense that this is the government body and um, then whatever this makes, it takes it to, I, to I, ISO, and that becomes the ISO standard later. So uh, this is somewhat confusing that their notation is very similar to ISO notation and IPU notation, to have a letter followed by a number and so on and so forth. So it's like X.25, X9.17. But anyway, so what they are saying is that we are using, going to use DES triple DES, 
and you are going to use triple dash three different times. E D E E D E E D E. E D E E encrypt, decrypt, and encrypt. And um, so first we take the date and time right now. So that makes sure that every time we don't use the same number again. Right? We use that as a kind of initialization value. We triple encrypt it. Whatever we get, we use here same way like exclusive or encrypt and exclusive or kind of set mode. You take a seed, you exclusive R and encrypt and um, then whatever comes out is your random stream or one time pad and then you feed it back here and you do again EDE with same keys. So the same keys go three places. K1, K2 go here, K1, K2 go here, K1, K2 go here. So this is EDE with two keys. And, and then this becomes the next seed. So this is very cryptographically very strong obviously and then it can be used for um, generating the one time pads. Alright, we already had this slide done, natural random noise. So now we are changing the topic. So, so far we talked about how to generate the one time pad and how to generate random keys. Random keys could be generated with, with that um, blum blum sub generator and the one time pad, pad can be generated by this NC generator. Um, so that is already the beginning of a stream cipher. A stream cipher is nothing but you take the bit stream, plain text, and you take the random stream and you exclusive and you send it out. That's it. And so the whole logic rides around how do you generate the random stream? It has to be such that nobody can predict it and so on and so forth because it is quite possible somebody can just send 0000000, 000 and they can observe the cipher text that would be exactly equal to the key stream. The, by the way, this is called key stream and I didn't, didn't want you to get confused because the key stream sounds like it is a key. It's not the key. Key stream is that one time pad. Key is here. But it is not a stream. Key is a number. Right? And using that key, you generate this stream, which is called key stream. So you exclusive are the plain text stream with the key stream bit by bit. If somebody sends 0, 0, 0, then you get the key stream written down. So like in the case of disk, if somebody wanted to write a zero block, they would write zero, 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 and then they will read it back as to what was written on the disk, they would get the key stream. So you don't want it to be predictable in any sense. And decryption is straightforward again, is that you take the same key, use the same generator to get the same key stream, and you exclude your R and you get the plain text. So one of the most popular, one of the popular generator is called RC4. R stands for RAN cipher text 4. Who is RAN? RAN is the RAN revest. The R in RSA. He has given many things to us including the RSA algorithm that we will talk about in some chapter but he has also given us RC1, RC2, RC3, RC4 and so on and so forth. Those are the stream ciphers and then he has given us home uh, the hashing functions like MD1, MD2, MD3, MD4, MD5. Many of you are using MD5 and you have at least heard of MD5. So those are all Drans creation. Alright, and obviously he has a whole company called RSA Incorporated, so I'm sure he's a billionaire. And he still teaches at MIT and you can, you know, <laughs> so I don't know how he's finding the time for all this. But here is first of is one of his creations, RC4. So obviously RC4 is fourth in the series of ciphers. RC1 was broken, so RC2 was created, RC2 was broken, so RC3 was created, RC3 was broken, so RC4 was created. And I think there is RC5 now, but I am not sure right now. But anyway, so RC4 is one we are going to talk about right now. It is owned by RSA and um, Ron Rivest. Um, it is basically a byte oriented stream cipher so you get a whole byte not a bit alright 
and it is widely used in SSL, PLS, BEP, WPA. SSL you must have heard about, all of you must have heard about, and we will talk about that also later on whenever you use HTTPS, right? That is SSL, and, and sometimes it is PLS. So, so that is, you are using RC4 there. And BEP is in the wireless, but if you are using Wi-Fi, then you have heard of WPA and BEP. And so there you are using RC4. So basically, he generates a random byte of 8 bits, and then you use it to exclude you are. And um, the way you do it is um, actually best explained um, in this picture, although the code is given here. So let me see. I will kind of flip between these three slides. I think the last slide should be sufficient to explain. So you take your key. Oh, first of all, before you take your key, you have a table of 255 numbers. First number is 0, second number is 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 255. These are 8 bit numbers. So the first 8 bits are 0, second one is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on and so forth, all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Right, so you have a table of 256 numbers, which are all the numbers that are possible in a sequence. Then you take your key, and you produce a big stream here, actually, by just repeating the key. So the first, let's say you have k bits in the key, first k bits, you just copy them as they are. And, um, and then you just repeat them. So the first bit, again, is copied here and then uh, here and you know somewhere there so every k bit you, you repeat the key and obviously I'm saying k bits but actually everything is in byte here so your keys are copied byte by byte and um, and then you repeat them you know byte by byte so this is the initial state of s and t and I don't know how he thinks about all this, and again, I cannot explain as to how he came up with this, but actually it must be strong enough. With very simple operation, you know, it is still being used for all the important things that we are doing. So the operation is very simple. But, um, so basically, he says, take number j, j starts with 0, by the way, and then whatever becomes here, it becomes. So you take a number j starting with 0, add the ith byte, of s and um, i at byte of t. So there are two, st two streams here, s and t tables. The s table is 256 byte long only, it doesn't go to infinity. The t also goes 256, yeah, okay, because we have repeated the key many times, so 256 byte. You just add up these two bytes to j and whatever value you get, you interchange sj with si. You swap them. And so this is at the beginning. So in the beginning, your table S, you do from I equal to 1 through 255. So the whole table, you start with a very simple table. But after this initial permutation, it becomes a random table. <coughs> All right? And the randomness depends upon the key. If you change the key, the table will be different. All right, so this is the initial permutation. We use the key to somehow change the table. Now, when you want to encrypt, all we do is we use j is equal to j plus si. We take the ith byte, which could be the first byte, when i equal to 0, we could just take the first byte. And then, again, we do the swapping, j equal to s, we find the new value of j, and we swap si and sj, and um, and then we add them to get the t, and st is what is sent out for encryption, and basically as the result. So there are three numbers. si, sj, they are swapped and added. After addition, whatever number comes out, we take that particular byte and output that as the ciphertext. I mean, actually, not the ciphertext, as the key stream. Right? And that key stream can be exclusive out to the plain text to get the ciphertext. 
So this is very fast in software, hardly few additions here, not even a multiplication of any kind. What is T? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so basically T, let's just start one more time. T is not used during the encryption at all, first of all, right? You notice that the, during the encryption, we just have S string. So T is used in the first, before we start in the algorithm, we start for initial permutation. T is used to mangle this table S, so that it is not from 0 through 255, right? And how it is mangled is that you start with T, which is just the key repeated many, many times. So T, the first, let's say your key is 5 bytes. Well, let's say start with good key. Key is 128 bits, so it is 16 bytes. So the first 16 bytes of T are same as the key. The next 16 bytes are again same as the key, just repeated. The next 16 bytes are again same as the key. So you just write down the key as many times as you need for 256 bytes. So in this case, in our example, 16 bytes, you will have to write 16 times to get how much? No, 16 bytes times 8 would be 128, 16, yeah. 16 times 16 is 256. So you write down the key 16 times, that is your T math T table. Okay? Then you use that T table to mangle the S table. Right? And the mangling formula is very simple. J plus SI plus TI gives you new value of J and then you swap J and I. SI and SJ. Right? So, I mean, this is something that actually a good exercise could be just to program this thing. It's very easy to program. Every book has a code written down. And so the code is already given here. Initialization, everything else is given here. So all you have to write is in your favorite language and you will start getting the ciphertext. I mean, you will start getting key streams and you can start getting the ciphertext for anything that you want to encrypt. You do have to make sure that the key is confidential so this T table is somehow erased after this first round and that the key is not kept in the memory because if the key is kept in the memory, somebody can get that key and then all your encryption is gone if they know you are using RC4 they can do it too. And key should not be kept in the memory, it should not be kept on the disk, it should not be kept anywhere, basically. So the idea is where do you keep it? That itself is a problem, right? But somewhere you keep it encrypted. Oh, this is, okay, so this is pseudo-random because, I mean, if you know the formula, you can reproduce the same thing exactly. So this is pseudo-random, but it is cryptographically strong. Cryptographically strong in the sense that if I gave you a few bytes of this, you won't be able to figure out the next byte. But if you know the key, it can be generated every time you do it morning, evenings, it will come out the same numbers. Right? So it is pseudo. Whereas in that other thing we had talked about, the X diamond or something, if you do it in the evening, the numbers are different. This table is prepared just in the beginning. Now you could do probably 1000 bytes or maybe 2000 bytes with this. You are using the same key. So now here is the thing though, then I think probably you are bringing up this is that how long can you use the same key? So you don't use the same key for very long. So if suppose you are working on a 10 gigabit system, probably you are going to use the key for maybe a second. Whereas you are working on a 10 megabit system, you can use it for 20 minutes or 20 seconds, you know, something like that. So most of these actually keys have a time to live. Remember, when you go to any HTTPS session, there is a time to live. If you don't use, do anything in that session, a pop-up comes up and says that your session is being discontinued now. Why? Because they don't want to start, you know, you, they start a new key sequence. The previous key has expired. So yeah, I, there is no limit in the algorithm as to how long can you use it. You could use it for two million bytes, but in practice you will keep your own safety not use it for very long. So basically what we do is, as I said, first we initialize S to be just I, I is equal to 0 through T55, and T is basically the key repeated, 
then you start with j equal to 0, i equal to 0 to 55, you add and then you swap, add and swap. So this is initial permutation. And then when you want to encrypt, you start with i equal to j equal to 0, and then you do this math, and then you swap s i and s j, and you get t, and you read s t, and you exclusive r with the plain text. Here m is the plain text, for whatever reason, not in p. M is the plain text. So that brings us to the end of that chapter. It's a short chapter. Three key summary points are that the pseudo random number generators use a seed and a formula to generate the next number. It's a very simple formula. And stream ciphers use an exclusive R, simple exclusive R with a random stream and the exclusive R, the plain text with the random stream to create the cipher text. And RC4 is a stream cipher visa.